This is On Belief, a podcast about cults by Karen Geyer. Season 2, Episode 14, John Atak. John Atak is something of a legend in the history of Scientology. He was with the organization while L. Ron Hubbard was still alive and still creating the tech. He later pioneered the independent Scientology movement and then left the group altogether. He has written the definitive history of the organization, a book called Let's Sell Them a Piece of Blue Sky, and he was also instrumental in the creation of one of the most authoritative sources on the history of L. Ron Hubbard, a book called Bareface Messiah by Russell Miller. Since leaving the organization, John has been involved in numerous lawsuits. As a consultant, he has helped numerous people leave groups and decompress and deal with reintegration. And he now has a YouTube channel where he and his son delve into topics about thought reform, coercion, and how to protect yourself from predators. Welcome, John. John, can you briefly explain how you became involved in the Church of Scientology and how far you got? I was 19. I'm a drummer and I'd been playing some gigs in Toulouse in France and things had gone badly wrong and I got stranded there. And when I got home, my girlfriend had disappeared. We'd been living together 15 months then and she just disappeared. So it was heartbreak, basically. And I read Science of Survival by Ron Hubbard, which was actually many years later as the historian of the subject, I discovered it was written by Richard DeMille uh, from notes and by Hubbard, but uh, Richard DeMille, the son of Cecil B. DeMille, which is, you know, another set of stories. I read that. I, I checked it out as best I could. I rang an Anglican priest who said he knew nothing about it. I, I talked with a, a psychiatrist that I'd, I'd met who knew nothing about it. I talked with a, a doctor, a general practitioner who knew nothing about it which is kind of weird because only three years before there'd been a massive press jamboree over the British government report on Scientology, which is a thoroughly damning document, largely composed of Aaron Hubbard's own statements. So uh, nobody warned me. So I went in, I got involved. I was involved for nine years. I was never what is called a total convert. Uh, that is, I was never a live-in member. I was never on the staff. I was not in the C organization. The two times I was shouted at, I shouted back. I was not abused or humiliated because as I'm creative, a musician, writer, artist, you get this special treatment. Even if you don't have any money to give them, you get this celebrity status. So I was, you know, I had a good time. You know, when one of their their lead attorney, Kendrick Moxon, in a deposition asked me, uh, had I been brainwashed in Scientology? I said, no, I was hypnotized a few times, but not brainwashed. I got up to the uh, fifth OT level, operating Thetan level, upper level. So I was supposedly clear. I did all of the release grades. I trained, I did six, what they call major counseling courses. So I was a method one auditor and a Dianetic auditor and a class two auditor. I had the great good fortune that I actually received very little auditing because I moved so quickly through it all. I was two levels short of the 27th and top level. In fact, technically, I did the 26th one because it's a training course for the 27th one. They've only released one level since then, OT8. So I basically felt that Hubbard had left the building because things were getting extraordinarily unpleasant. There was a list of 900 people who were declared suppressive. And when I questioned this, I was told their names were on the list, so they were suppressive. And I pointed out that You actually had to have a committee of evidence and some sort of little mock trial and declare findings. You couldn't just put people's name on a list. That wasn't permissible within Hubbard's teaching, but I was told it now was. And so I left and I found myself at the center of the independent Scientology movement. About half the membership left. There were probably about 50,000 members internationally in 1983 when I left. They were claiming, I think, 8 million, but... um, they were counting the little body thetans too, you know, the little spirits and men attached to you, I think. I found myself at the centre of it, um, setting up an independent Scientology, and I stopped believing. 
fundamentally because a bunch of documents uh, collected by journalists who uh, worked under the assumed name of Michael Lynn Shannon found their way to me. And I read these documents and unlike most people who've been involved in, in such groups, I didn't seek to justify them. I didn't seek to you know, claim they were fake. They, they looked pretty genuine to me. And I was able over the next several years to verify every document in that pile that he'd failed a course in atomic and molecular physics at university and went on to claim he was a nuclear physicist and had a doctorate and was a civil engineer and all of these sort of lies. And for me, that was the end of it because I believed what Hubbard had said, which is that the road to truth must be trod with true steps and that honesty is sanity. And so by his own logic, he, he was not sane and he was not trustworthy. So Unlike most members, rather than picking away at it and deciding that some of it worked and some of it didn't and that sort of thing, I rejected the lot. I, I said, I'm, from this point, I'm going to say, I, I don't believe any of this and I will inspect piecemeal, bit by bit. And any that I feel is true, I, I will readopt. And I must say, there's nothing significant that came. You know, it's now 36 years ago and I've never wanted to pick up the cans again and have any auditing there's never been a moment where I've, I've doubted my decision and I became the historian of the group I wrote a book which is now called let's sell these people a piece of blue sky which remains the only history of the group and I, I'm not sure that there's any history of any of the other post-war cult groups it just doesn't seem to happen you know academics write papers about it but doing a thoroughgoing history saying you know this is the biography of the leader this is you know, the history step by step of the group it doesn't seem to happen very much. Russell Miller, who was working for the Sunday Times, and I think at the time was the highest paid journalist in the UK, he came to me and wanted to do some pieces for the Sunday Times. He was trying to find where Hubbard was. This was in January 86. And the news of Hubbard's death came out about a week after I signed the contract to be his researcher. They went ahead with these very good pieces and he decided he was a bio biographer, had written biographies of Hefner and Getty by that time would write a, a very good biography of Conan Doyle later. I'd written a book which I couldn't get published so I let him have the manuscript and by strange happenstance the manuscript came back to me. I, I now have it with his handwritten notes on it of which chapter titles he was going to use and which bits. So his book which is a very good book because he also did great interviews. He interviewed uh, Ron Hubbard's aunt you know so that all of these they make these claims about him being a blood brother of the Blackfoot uh, Pakuni people. And he interviews the aunt who was in the house throughout Hubbard's childhood, who says, no, uh, we didn't hear anything about the Blackfoot people. <laughs> you know, uh, That's completely made up. So he got lots of interviews. He got lots of documents. He added that. So, you know, probably about half of his book came from, from my work and half of it came from his work. That's Barefaced Messiah, which is still the only good, thorough biography of Hubbard. I then spent 12 years helping people who were coming out, found that many of them had complex post-traumatic stress disorder. They were in a really bad way, particularly the people who'd been in the sea organization who are virtually slaves. They work a 90 hour week. At that time, they weren't allowed to see their children very often. Since David Miscavige took over, they're not allowed to have children. So that solved that problem. And they literally be earning two dollars a week for this 90 hours and they'd be in terrible fetid conditions you know packed into dormitories and I felt embarrassed that I spent nine years involved without ever realizing that there were these people who lived on rice and beans and nothing else you know I remember a guy boasting to me that yeah but we got a potato with cheese on a Sunday sometimes you know it's just you're kidding me that what had started out as what was meant to be a, a way of relieving trauma with Dianetics had become a way of traumatizing people. The, the end of it was that when Hubbard died, he left $648 million, and yet he'd forbidden toilet rolls to his staff because they weren't producing enough. So they'd had to go and steal phone directories, you know. To I spent 12 years involved in about 150 court cases as a consultant. I was registered as an expert witness on Scientology in the High Court in 1987 in one of Russell Miller's cases. I was usually in the background of those cases providing documents. We won a lot of cases. I charged almost nothing. Clients, in fact, who took $14 million, I was paid 
two thousand dollars for for the work i did on those cases just because you leave and you have this kind of crazy idea that you've got to be totally ethical which you have got to be but being totally ethical includes not charging people money so i've been involved in the recovery of about 600 people three of whom paid me anything so i don't have any money in the bank so if anybody's listening and would like to send me some money uh, that would be greatly appreciated they sued me i tried to sue them they sued me in new york first and my life became a misery with private detectives you know with the full-on harassment that is usual the, the gossip campaign saying I was a rapist, I, an attempted murderer, a, a child molester, a heroin addict. I've never in my life actually, as far as I know, been in the same room as any heroin, let alone been addicted to it or, or sold it to anyone. They put out smear campaigns. I was followed by private detectives. My whole family were approached by a, an American private detective who flew over specially to do it. Uh, my father was very ill at the time, so it was not welcome intrusion into his life this guy also traveled to australia to meet the girlfriend who'd run away from me when i was 19. i got apology calls from people that they'd talked to him you know people i hadn't heard from for 20 years or something were, were phoning up to say oh this guy came around and we didn't realize who he was and we're sorry we talked to him but it became unbearable in 1993 i the head of intelligence came out to do some harassment on me and ended up three hours later breaking down in tears. And the next day came and told me her terrible story and admitted that she'd got four agents in my close circle because anybody who came to me, I'd talked to. And uh, one in training, she proved that by telling me what I'd said to one of the agents the week before. And she said that they'd spent more than two million pounds in harassing me in, in trying to close me down and it just became too much because there was no support from government no support from the courts no support from anywhere really from ex-members as well so i went bankrupt uh, over litigation costs so you know because they couldn't pay my lawyers basically in the end british libel laws are revered the world around however if you are on the wrong end of one it becomes a rich man's game and the person who has the deepest pockets wins and the goal is to make your opponent spend themselves into oblivion i lost two cases against them one of them was a libel case but they never got to trial all lost in what's called the paper mountain that's what the scientology lawyers call it where you just keep issuing the stuff six months later lord justice wolf who'd investigated the english system uh, this was back in, or oh, what, 95, said it is the case in English justice that he with the deepest pockets wins. Since then, our libel laws have changed significantly. I don't think they'd have been able to, I mean, I don't think they'd have won the case if it had gone to court anyway, frankly, because I'd suggested really that this woman had used Scientology counselling techniques on someone, which is probably not libelous to a Scientologist. But it put me in a situation where I realised that there was no protection. And I'd lost a five bedroom house, my marriage had collapsed, my health was gone from all the stress of 12 years of this. And so I withdrew in 1996. I, I sort of went, I'm not going to do this anymore because there's not even much in the way of gratitude, let alone support for doing it. And they kept on harassing me for another four years, because that's the way it is. And eventually they stopped and another dozen years went by. A TV producer friend said, would you come on this BBC programme, The Big Questions? And I was very hesitant and then went, yeah, OK. And they made a mistake. If they had harassed me after that, I would have gone back into the shadows. But they didn't. So I'm on a television show where I talk about the materials of operating Thetan level three, Xenu and the body Thetans, as publicized by South Park so beautifully. I didn't even get a lawyer's letter. And that showed that it was safe maybe to talk. And at the same time, I realized that for the most part, and I hate to say this, people who've been deeply involved, total converts, who've been deeply involved with um, an authoritarian group or indeed an authoritarian relationship, don't tend to recover unaided. What you get is a kind of bicker fest where for years people will talk about what a dreadful time they had, which is fair enough, you should talk about that. 
but they become locked in this cycle of grievance rather than actually digging deep and finding out whether they still believe any of the dogma of the group they belong to. And most recovery manuals, the one I recommend is Lalich and Tobias, Take Back Your Life, which is a wonderful book. But nonetheless, it doesn't, I think, go far enough in saying, if you've come to believe something, then you need to question it, because otherwise it will carry on. So with Scientologists, for example, you're taught about the overt motivator sequence. You always had ugly words for things. And overt is where you commit an offence against another person, a sin or a crime. And a motivator is your justification for doing it, which will be how they hurt you. And Hubbard said, well, usually you'll hurt them first and then they'll hurt you back and then you'll blame them. Well, this could be so. But elsewhere, it's called karma vipaka. And when Scientologists leave, they start now believing in karma. And I say to them, so you've read some of the Hindu and Buddhist material on this? And they go, no. I say, well, you know, that would be a good idea to think about it a bit more deeply. And indeed, there's a little piece about karma and caste on my YouTube channel, because mathematically karma is not possible. You know, there are too many living entities in the universe for their experience to be integrated so smoothly and beautifully so that 417 people get onto a plane on the same moment and that's the plane that goes down. The mathematics necessary for that to happen, the, the laws of chance, run so far into the trillions that I'm afraid it's not possible. In terms of it being a moral guide, as the Buddhists tend to say, yeah, there's something there. But they'll come away believing that. Or, for example, they'll still believe in reincarnation, in, in past lives, as Alistair Crowley and Ron Hubbard both call it, without realizing that to the Buddhists and the Hindus, this is a dreadful thing. It's called the fear of the eternal return in Buddhism. It's not a, oh, in my next lifetime, I'll be able to do this. You're trying to escape the wheel of suffering. But they'll continue to believe. And I'm not saying what people should or shouldn't believe. That's up to you, what you believe. But I am saying that we need to inspect our beliefs. And if we've been through an authoritarian experience where our emotions have been you know, severely damaged, our emotional autonomy has been questioned, then we do really need to look at what the dogma is, what the doctrine is, and say, you know, do I still believe that Jesus raised people from the dead? And you might do. And that's fine. I don't, that, this I don't mind about. It's just the problem with uninspected material and unquestioned assumptions, as I call them, that to become emotionally autonomous, which for me is the goal of human maturity, of growing up, um, to become emotionally autonomous, we are not being bullied and pushed around either by people or ideas. And so I came back in 2013 and for a couple of years wrote for Tony Ortega. There are about 70 blogs there about recovery and how to think about specifically Scientology and what I call its implanting system, the way that it gets people to believe and behave in a certain way. And then I stopped doing that. So I gave a five-day conference called Getting Clear with 27 other participants in Toronto. And I figured I'd nailed it there. And if anybody wants to kick out $50, they can rent it and have a look at it on Vimeo. You know, even for people who've not been in Scientology, it should show, you know, because Scientology does everything that you can do to somebody. My friend Christian Sherko used to give my little booklet, um, Scientology, The Cult of Greed, to anybody who approached him, you know, as a first book to read, because he said, well, Scientology does everything. They'll find something in there that's been done to them. One of your jobs while you were with Scientology was to recruit people. So can you walk me through some of your most effective recruiting methods? Well, firstly, I, I object to the term church in, in, in that statement. <laughs> There's no need for you to apologize. It, it, it's one of those ways of using language to con people into believing something. And church is, is what's called a per word. It's a word that conjures up ideas of goodness until, of course, you sort of Think about the Church of Satan, though I'm told that the guy who runs that's a really nice guy, actually. <laughs> church specifically means a Christian community. That is its meaning. So if we thought about the synagogue of Scientology, that would give you some parallel. The word was deliberately used by Hubbard to trick people into this warm feeling about, oh, well, it's a religious thing. In the same way, you know, the word religion, you know, religion started with human sacrifice. It's not necessarily a good idea, children, to try and do this at home. But we do have these natural emotional reactions to certain things. 
Scientology has a very specific form called the dissemination drill, where you make contact with somebody, you then make sure that they don't have any negative ideas about Scientology. The, usually, all you have to do is you know, say, where did you hear that? They'd say, I read it in the newspaper, and you could say, well, do you know how trustworthy newspapers are? I never had anybody who didn't accept that as a response, which is quite a thought. That, that is how little trust people have in the media and that mightn't be you know too bad an idea I certainly think we should be very skeptical at all times from there in Scientology what you seek to do is find the ruin that is go for the thing that this person thinks is making their life a misery the thing that they're having problems with if you find out that it's a psychiatric problem then you walk away because you're not meant to take people in who've had psychiatric trouble. That didn't stop me. I was quite happy to talk to journalists who are again forbidden, to communists who are forbidden, uh, and to homosexuals who are forbidden entry to Scientology, though they've tried to play that last one down more recently. But it was a specific part that you weren't meant to talk to such people. I was fine talking to anybody and because I felt I was sharing something wonderful with them. I also balked at the idea of finding somebody's ruin because then what you do is you get into what's called fear of worsening. You sort of say, you've tried everything, haven't you? Yeah. And it, nothing's worked, has it? No. And you've got no hope that anything will work, have you? You, know, you basically push them into their worst nightmare and then you offer them need of change. You say, well, you, you need to change that and you then offer them Scientology. And certainly when I was involved back in the, the mid-70s, early 80s, the only thing you offered them was what was called the communication course. And that was if they had money problems, if they had romantic problems, you again avoided medical problems. You were meant to keep away from that because that might mean that you'd be charged with practicing medicine without a license somewhere along the way. If you add into that, you can expand those stages. Since the early 90s, I've studied terrorism, gangs, human trafficking, authoritarian personal relationships. I've looked at everything and anything and seeing the same patterns. So it was very interesting when I got my hands on a, an Al-Qaeda recruiting manual and found that they too have a very systematic approach which covers some of the same material. It would there be they're looking to recruit Muslims by looking at the way in which Muslims have been offended and persecuted through the ages. And um, it's fair to say that members of pretty much all religious groups have been offended and persecuted, as have atheists somewhere or other. There's a book called The Islamist by Ed Hussain, who was recruited by Omar Bakri in London. And he, I'm pretty sure, is talking about having using the methods that are described in the Al-Qaeda manual. And the fundamental one, which is not really emphasized in Scientology, but the Moonies are very good at it, is flattery, love bombing, creating a rapport with somebody so that they will feel special and then you'll get them into a kind of honeymoon period where they'll be in the group and they'll be told how wonderful they are up until the point where you've got them and they're snagged and you can then either take all of their money or in Scientology you either take all of their money or you put them into the C organization and the hard selling is very intense in Scientology. Ron Hubbard really wanted people to um, yeah, let me see if I can find a, a little snippet from the sacred scriptures of Scientology here about hard selling. The governing policy of Scientology, as stated by its creator, is to make money, make more money, and make other people produce so as to make money. That is entitled the governing policy. Unusual for religion, possibly. And of the courses I did, the advanced courses, the advanced courses are the most valuable service on the planet. Life insurance, houses, cars, stocks, bonds, college savings, all are transitory and impermanent. Advanced courses last forever and give immortality. There is nothing to compare with advanced courses. They are infinitely valuable and transcend time itself. And in a dispatch called What is Life Worth? The importance of hard sell, Hubbard said, hard sell is a must in dissemination and selling of services and materials. And elsewhere he said, you tell him that he's going to sign up right now and he's going to take it right now. One does not describe something, one commands something. You will find that a lot of people are in a more or less hypnotic daze and they respond to direct commands in literature and ads. Hard sell means insistence that people buy. 
So that's very much the recruiting attitude in Scientology. I met a guy who will probably be working for the rest of his life to pay off his debts. And he was a man of oh, what, 35 or something because he borrowed money because they were asking for money to build yet another Scientology facility. And he donated, I think it was 35,000 pounds. And in return, he was going to be given a car parking space with his name on it when the building was finished. And as I say, he's working two jobs and quite possibly will be for the rest of his life to pay off money he borrowed. A question I get asked a lot by people who listen to the show is, why does it seem like there are a lot more cults out there and a lot more people becoming involved in cults? Is that just that it actually is a phenomenon more people are joining or is it a fact that there's just more coverage of it? What's your opinion? Well, I think there was a drastic change at the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century in that the European countries had fought wars to establish the hegemony of particular religions. So there were, there were areas that were Catholic, that the Anglican Church ruled in the UK, Church of Ireland, Church of Scotland, Church of England. And what happened was that tolerance started coming about because the founding fathers of the United States included deists who were not specifically Christian. And this is not talked about a great deal in America, but, uh, and I don't believe they were members of the Illuminati. Let me just throw that in there for the fun of it. But they had a different belief. And so they asserted religious tolerance. In 1820 in Britain, the acts of tolerance were ruled. And it meant that you could have now this great diversity. Eventually, even Roman Catholics were allowed to vote in, in English elections. And I think that led to more and more diversity. And in the late 19th century, there was a, a vast importation of, well, and actually Napoleon, uh, his people around about 1800 were bringing back Islamic mystical ideas, which is where the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons seem to take a certain amount, dollop of their strange materials from, uh, from Sufis. So then you have people like Ralph Waldo Trine, in touch with the infinite or whatever it's called, and Mary Baker Eddy, who learns about hypnosis and decides it will cure everything, but it's actually Jesus. There's a great diversity, um, theosophy, of course, you know, Madame Blavatsky. Hindu ideas are coming in, Buddhist ideas are coming in, and it just keeps on going in the 20th century. Our distinction must be about what we think a cult is. Now, technically, a cult is, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's a body of adherence who are devoted to a particular person or idea. Now, up to 1977, that's the meaning. What it's come to mean since then, and the American dictionary makers decided to make up new meanings, because the Oxford, of course, relies, I think it's on 400 printed or media statements where a word is used in a particular meaning before they'll accept the meaning. So up until 1977, there hadn't been 400 meanings registered with the Oxford dictionary about anything pejorative or unpleasant about a cult. So when we use the word cult nowadays, we mean a group of people who are devoted to something that's bad for them. And I'm sure that that's what your, your question meant. Groups that are dangerous to people have always existed. I would point to the witch burnings and the heretic trials of, you know, of supposedly Christian Europe. Our need to believe, our sense of certainty, which I think is perhaps the the single most important factor and almost never talked about, why am I sure of what I believe? You know, when I was 17, I spent a couple of hours having a conversation with a born again recruiter. And because I'm a friendly sort of person, it wasn't an argument. I wasn't fighting with him. I was just curious. And at the end of it, he backed away from me, making sure that I didn't leap on him and devour him, I think. I was quite friendly with him. But that's probably he's been warned that it's the friendly ones are the worst ones. Um, it's the ones where you can see the horns and the steam coming out. You don't need to worry about. It. And he backed away from me. He said, I don't understand the Bible, but I know it's all true. And that set me up for life. That was sort of, yeah, we do that, don't we? We believe things so fervently that we treat them as knowledge. And the truth is, I'm willing to play with anybody's thoughts. So when a militant atheist comes to me and I say, well, and I'm an agnostic, by the way. I'm, I've never got far enough to actually have any real knowledge of where the universe came from, where it's going or what's going on. Um, I tend to believe in the scientific interpretations, but 
so when a militant atheist comes to me and says, well, you know, it all, you know, I say, well, how did it all start? And they say the Big Bang. And I say, and how do you know that? They say, oh, the background microwave radiation, which is, you know, the same whichever direction you point your radio telescope. And I say, and how do you know that? And they go, well, we've read it. And it's like, so I read in the Bible that it says, have you actually been through Stephen Hawking's mathematical proof of the Big Bang? And as yet, I've not met anybody who has. And I must say, I wouldn't be able to get through the first sentence myself. We, we elevate our beliefs to, to the level of certainty uh, called noesis by the great William James, the father of religious psychology, father of most psychology, in fact, that he, in the varieties of religious experience in 1901, is, is kind of going, you know, isn't this curious? The, this determination to believe things. And so people become ensnared in a belief system and you'll find the Westboro Baptists, for example, you know, who decide they're going to go and insult the families of uh, fallen soldiers with placards saying they're all fags. And Megan Phelps Roper, who is the granddaughter of Fred Phelps, who founded the Westboro Baptist, on, I think she's on a book tour at the moment, but I was really impressed with an interview with her. And she said, well, I grew up inside this, believing this. So we push on towards giving an answer to your question, which and I will eventually, I'm sure of it, that if you start including the authoritarian family cults, where you, you might just have a husband and wife, one of whom is the boss, then yes, the, the problem is everywhere. It's always been everywhere. When you look at the terrible things that the Puritans did, you know, the Salem witch trials and these kind of things, or the Nazis or the Bolsheviks, you know, they certainly fit all of the criteria for a, a destructive authoritarian group. And I kind of like to shift away from the word cult and say that the problem is authoritarianism. It, it's where we don't get uh, any rights. There's no democracy. There's no consensus where we have to follow something because it's the received word of God. You know, it's like you've got to do this because somebody wrote a story about Moses 2,000 years ago or two and a half thousand years ago, and now you've got to do what it says. Like on Sunday, I, I did an interview with Michelle Haslam, who, who's a doctor of psychology, who left the new Kadampa tradition. What amazed me, because my background was in Buddhism, before I got into Scientology, I'd had a couple of years, I'd, I'd learned the Zen meditation in a monastery, sadly in the north of England, not in some beautiful cherry blossom grove in, in Japan. But I'd nonetheless, I, I was taught Zazen and, uh, you know, I have some understanding of Buddhism and I very rarely meet anybody who claims to be a Buddhist who knows anything about Buddhism. <laughs> you know, they've been in one of these little cults, one of these little authoritarian groups that makes, wants them to worship the teacher, which could not be more opposite to what the Buddha taught, particularly in what's called the Kalama Sutta, which I, again, I've just done a little video about, so people have to go onto my channel now to, to see that. Where the Buddha says that you shouldn't believe anything because of tradition, because of your priests and sages, because of some wise person of the past, because your imagination leads you to believe that a god has whispered it in your ear, but you should check everything. And this is a fundamental teaching of Buddhism that most Buddhists don't seem to know because in the Mahayana traditions, which dominate the Tibetan, Japanese, Thai, Burmese, they're all Mahayana, great vehicle sects. They say, oh, don't bother reading the sutras, you know, <laughs> just, just meditate and, or contemplate on compassion or what have you. And it, it's quite shocking. I'm absolutely with the Buddha on this, that we each of us have to check things and we have to check the measures we're using to check with as well. We have to be willing to question the assumptions we have and the surprising thing is that I think cognitive dissonance, which makes the world wobble when our beliefs are questioned, you come to actually embrace it. You come to actually like the idea that you're going to have to think about something that you believe. And it's not threatening at all to be told that you know, my ideas about cats are, are foolish. I'm, I'm happy to listen to what people have to say. Go away and think about it. Maybe read a bit about it talk to my cat about it, obviously, and, you know, where necessary, change my behaviour because my beliefs are wrong. You know, my great friend Ari Chaleff wrote a wonderful book called Intelligent Disobedience, where he questions obedience as the central tenet of education. As he points out, you know, with a guide dog, it has to be able to, if, if there's a blind uh, person with a guide dog, 
The dog has to be able to say, no, don't walk into that. It, it has to be disobedient, but intelligently so. Yet our children are told to, they've got to put their hand up if, if they you know, want to pay a visit. There's this tremendous emphasis on doing as you're told rather than training children to, to become inquisitive, to be curious, to be willing to say, that doesn't sound right to me. You know, can you prove that? You know, and to be assertive, I think it's the greatest change we could make in the world by allowing our children to be intelligently disobedient. Mine certainly are. They're sometimes unintelligently disobedient too. But. Okay, but why now? Are people now more susceptible to cults and coercion than they were maybe back in the 70s? I think the emphasis has shifted. I think the susceptibility is very high. I think at any point where you have been dislocated from your community, you've gone to a new job, first year in college, there are times when you're more susceptible in, in adolescence and in senescence, you know, when you get to my kind of age, um, you are more susceptible. There's no doubt about it. In the teen years, it's because uh, your infatuation has suddenly been turned on. You know, you know that you're a teenager when you can really fall in love with something. And that makes you very easy prey. So a lot of recruiting is done in the first term at university. It's why many universities the world over ban certain groups from coming onto campus. So there's a susceptibility there. I think that's always there. What has changed, and, and my study this year has been of the internet, and there, there's a concept called leaderless resistance. I've just written a chapter with Steve Hassan about this for the Oxford University Press, which you know everybody can run out and buy next year sometime. But it, it fascinated me doing the research because what we were looking for was people who'd committed horrible acts. And we chose Elliot Roger, the Ila Vista killer, who was an involuntary celibate or incel and killed six people uh, in Santa Barbara, in California. And uh, Dylan Roof, who, of course, shot nine black people dead in a church. And neither of them had a leader. Neither of them had somebody who was telling them what to do. They were both quite forthright in their views. Uh, Dylan Roof published a manifesto called The Last Redition, which is still online, of course, the internet being a wonderful place. And in nine pages, talks such arrant nonsense as you would never believe. He'd been upset, so he'd gone and looked at sort of white nationalist, as they're now calling them, sites, and come to swallow the belief that black people preferred to be slaves. You know, it, it's obvious from the hundreds, he says he read hundreds of accounts uh, of this. And I would have referred him to the journals of Thomas Thistlewood if he wanted to know how much fun it was being a slave. Uh, I don't recommend that anybody squeamish read them, frankly, because they're the most despicable thing. But that he was a a slave owner in the West Indies, and, and describes the, the kind of treatment that he meted out, which was horrible, utterly, utterly horrible. I think that the internet has created a situation where people are now actually taking up crazy beliefs. We, we also this year did a chapter on anti-Semitism, and that people are adopting crazy beliefs because they were not taught at school how to analyse material and you know, work out whether it's true or false. They just had stuff pumped into them to remember and regurgitate in exams. And it is so utterly, utterly wrong. I don't think the susceptibility has changed. I think the danger has changed because, you know, as in the late 19th century, there were radical anarchist ideas and people were being blown up. That's how uh, World War I kick-started by a, an anarchist managing to kill the Archduke of Austria. And we are seeing the same sort of violence again because rational dialogue is, is not taking place and podcasts such as your own are part of the remedy to that. I, I think that it's wonderful that the media is no longer controlled by Murdoch and Maxwell and a, a handful of others, that anybody can go out there and talk. I mean, the CIA will probably come round and shut you up if you say anything too nasty. No, I don't mean that. They're, they're lovely people at the CIA. I, I'm sorry that I've offended them. That there is this discussion that's taking place now on the internet, which is the antidote. But we still, all of us need to understand what the mechanisms in play in the human psyche are. So we need a psychological education. And that is a social psychological education. The works of you know, people like Milgram and Zimbardo, uh, Robert the Great, Robert J. Lifton, they have much to teach us about how 
we comply that that it's not it we are naturally compliant good people want to be sociable and so we look to social proof what are the all the people around me doing i'll i'll do that and we do it without thinking and we don't teach assertiveness we don't teach doubt and questioning and so that means that if you can amplify that compliance by using methods of guided imagination let's call it that then you can actually get people to do ridiculous things darren brown has done some quite remarkable things his show the push which was called push to the edge when it first came out in which he demonstrates that in a single evening somebody can go through a set of processes which will lead them to seek to kill somebody they've never met and it's a show that everybody should watch i I think most of his stuff everybody should watch because he shows you how compliant we are i said it earlier we need to grow up that i think we live in a consumer society that wants everybody to be 16 years old and do as they're told and buy what they're told to buy at the same time that the world is burning down through our overconsumption and our misuse of of fossil fuels you you have this terrible contradiction i mean for me it became evident as a you know when i was about 13 i was at school and i realized that the school was meant to be a christian school which would have the virtues of jesus which would be things like giving all your money to the poor but what was really liked was being powerful and bossy and earning lots of money and that conflict hit me very early on but but then you know we had the hippie movement to explain it to me when i was a kid, which didn't seem to go very far or, you know, i suppose the green movement really does come out of the hippie movement so that's a good thing but we live in such a complex set of contradictions and when somebody comes along and says i'm certain i know what we ought to do people will follow them when you you know even try and read a few paragraphs of mein kampf my struggle by hitler all you have is certainty you know, that intellectuals fell in with, with the Nazis because they're going, it's too confusing. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to think. And somebody comes along and says, I know the answers. And it's almost guaranteed that when somebody says that, that they don't. Look at, say, um, Janja Lelich's description of the Heaven's Gate cult in uh, Bound of Choice, where you have the ridiculous things that these people are, are willing to do. You know, they're willing to, to be um, castrated. <laughs> Uh, they're willing to kill themselves because they have come to believe they are going to catch the a falling star and put it in their pocket and go off on the hail bop comet to to another dimension. And I th- think on that point, it's very important to say that there is nobody who is not susceptible. And the reason we're susceptible is because I know that advertising works on other people, but it doesn't work on me. You know. I had a situation where I had a young man who had been at the highest level of Scientology. He was one of the the group of 14 that ruled Scientology. They took their orders directly from Hubbard and he'd left. And I interviewed him over two evenings. Um, Our deal was that I would never name him and I never have. And he was very useful to me, very helpful. I actually interviewed three people who were on that watchdog committee. So just to confuse things a little there so he doesn't get into any trouble. But at the end of our interviews over two evenings, he said, see, the great thing, John, is we'll never be fooled again. And I looked at him and said, the great thing is I know I'm very gullible. So I check things and I think about it and I go and read a book about it or ask a friend or Google it, you know. And that's the only protection I have. It hasn't protected me throughout my life. I've involved myself with borderline narcissistic people and suffered the consequences. It's what. Robert Cialdini, the great Robert Cialdini says in Influence, that that he started researching influence as a psychologist because he's a patsy, you know, because anybody can sell him anything. I'm not sure where Bob is on that now. You know, know, it it may still be the case. But by realising that about yourself, you've got a chance. The people who go, I'm invulnerable. Nobody could ever reach me. I used to recruit them in half an hour, you know, when I was in Scientology. So arrogance is not good for us is, is, is the lesson. <laughs> Hubris is bad. We teach kids about stranger danger, meaning that if somebody tries to coerce you into a van, most kids will know to call somebody that they trust and run away. But we don't teach kids how to identify these types of predators, these coercive thought reforming predators, but they're all around us. Why? Why aren't we doing that? Isn't it incredible? I, I mean, I, all of these years, 36 years since, since I left Scientology and I've been studying everything and anything I could 
get my hands on. I've, I've met some of the, and you know, I'm friends with some of the, you know, the the people who've who've done deep investigations into this. I'm in contact with all sorts of people, trying to understand the problem. And I came to it eventually, saying, well, yeah, let's boil this down to the simplest ideas. And what shocked me was this. It probably, if you've had a severe experience in an authoritarian group or relationship, it probably takes you about 10 years to recover. It probably takes about two hours to proof somebody up so that they can recognize a human predator, the agent of a human predator, because you'll usually be approached by a recruiter, not by the predator themselves. Um, though in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, you are dealing with a predator, a pickup artist, you know, what have you. To write the list that that uh, I use in in the video on the YouTube channel, I read seven books, and uh, that was updating. You know, in the eighties, I was reading about it to try and understand Hubbard's personality, which was fairly complex: um, a manic, depressive, narcissistic sociopath who probably had temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, you know, would just about sum it up. For example, people who brag a lot, people who boast a lot are not to be trusted. And I think there's a cultural difference. I think Canada is probably more like Britain with regard to, to boastfulness that, that we regard it as embarrassing. The American thing is it's a lot, you can blow your own trumpet. And if, obviously if you're Louis Armstrong, that's a really good thing, you know, but when it comes down to braggadocio and building yourself up, one should be suspicious of people who, who say that. People who want you to take risks, people who are willing to confess to having done the most horrible things. People who apologize profusely and then do it again, do exactly what they've done before again. People who flatter you. You know, a friend of mine said that, you know, flattery can be a good thing. And I said, not, not in the dictionary I use, because it means insincere praise. <laughs> Though I was flattered by what he said. It is a bit complicated, that use of the word, isn't it? Very flattering. You know, it was very insincerely <laughs> praising what you just know, whatever. But people who flatter you and tell you how great you are, you know, pickup artists who are wonderful predators. It's fascinating to me that Tom Cruise should be a, a hardcore member of Scientology and yet should have made such a good film in Magnolia about how pickup artists function. And they want to move into your space. They want to touch you physically to reassure you. You know, a pickup artist approaching a woman will, will touch her hair. They will offer you some sort of trivial gift, like a you know a one dollar necklace or something. Reciprocity: if I give you something, you should give me something back. So there are very straightforward techniques. Rob Cialdini's seven points of influence. I think six of them you can find in a, a wonderful animation online. Every child should see these things because. When somebody says to you, look, you've got to buy now because by tomorrow everything will be gone. It's the last possible chance. It's a Black Friday deal and so on and so forth. You know that the next day it will be cheaper because they'll still have stock that they haven't got rid of. You know, it's just the way it is. We fall for certain pictures and it's realizing in some psychologists view all communication as selling, as making bids for attention. There might be a little bit of cynicism in there, but you know, which, which I'm wary of. But certainly when you're dealing with a recruiter who wants you to join a group or, or to get into a relationship with them, you're dealing with selling. So understanding how that works, there's a movie called Suckers, which is not watched enough, which is about uh, secondhand car salesmen made by my friend Roger Nygaard. And it's a very funny movie. And afterwards you get a documentary where the sales guy who advised him goes through all the things that a car salesman will do with you. You know, like uh, when they leave the room to go and talk to the boss to see if they can get you this deal, they're actually going out to have a cigarette. And then they'll come back in and say, oh, well, the boss, you know, it, there's a script. Uh, sorry, do you, have you seen the movie Sorry to Bother You? Uh, yeah, it, it, I mean, it is a bit scary at the point where we don't, spoil it but it does get a bit scary but that idea the wonderful way of you know, i'm sorry to bother you but and then getting somebody into conversation and finding out how to scam them yeah you know, human beings are generally such uh, friendly creatures that we are easy to con that our confidence is easily won by somebody and so teaching how to recognize you know the stranger danger of of the person who's coming up to you 
and offering you, you know, a free necklace or some incense sticks or a booklet or, you know, a copy of the Watchtower magazine, that that is reciprocity. That they, once somebody gives us something, it's normal to, to want to give them something back. And what they're looking for is to take you into their group when you're feeling down and somebody projects happiness at you and they you know when i got in scientology the people were so cheerful you know they were smiling and laughing all the time and then a few months down the line as i came to know them and and they were my friends i saw them you know behind the scenes i saw them becoming upset and dejected about the pressure they were being put under and i didn't understand what i was looking at but in public they're taught to glow, you know, they're taught to, to be attractive. So you have children. What do you teach your children about these types of predators and how to avoid them? Well, of course, my son, Sam, who's 17, does um, YouTubes with me and is studying psychology and sociology. It is has become very knowledgeable on, on these subjects. My two older children, my oldest boy is 34 and my daughter is 31, yeah, you know, while I was still learning about this, you know, they were born not so long after, you know, I left Scientology in 83, they were born in 85 and 88. Uh, so I was still coming to terms with it. The first thing that was important to me was that I wasn't going to be a tyrant, that I wasn't going to bully them. I certainly wasn't ever going to hit them. I wasn't going to threaten them. I wasn't going to yell at them. I was going to seek to talk things through and, and to bring them to an understanding. And that meant making it safe for them to challenge me. So that, you know, with my, my oldest boy, he was about eight and he said something that I didn't think was true. And I said, it, you know, I, I don't think that's true. If you can prove that, I'll give you a pound. And it was true. So uh, I had to give a pound. I still resent that to this day. But it meant that I said to him, please do that, please. And it's meant that, that I believe that all four of my children are, are willing to ask me about anything. It also means that when my son went up to university and somebody offered him uh, methamphetamine at a party, he was 400 miles away or something, his reaction was to get on the phone and call me up and say, somebody's offered me this, what do you think? And I said, I, I wouldn't do that, you know. <laughs> I don't think that's a good idea. And he didn't. For me, that's the best parental relationship where your children are not hiding things from you and lying and going behind your back that, that they know that you're on their side again the objective of parenting for me is you start with a helpless little creature that's utterly dependent on you by the age of 18 they should be able to do their own laundry you know they, they should be able to go out into the world as adults and start you know doing the next bit of learning which i think the romans were probably right to them Adolescence ended at the age of 32, I believe. And adulthood, which would be the last few years of your life, of course, in Roman society, living past 40 would be quite unusual, unless you were you know, a rich person. But nonetheless, adulthood began at 32. And I think there may be some truth to that. I think in our society, adulthood begins at about 75, you know, or maybe later, because we are meant to be, you know, our politicians, I, I dislike politics and what's happening everywhere in the world. Look at the, the leaders we have, uh, Duterte, Bolsonaro, Modi, Abe, Putin, Trump, Boris Johnson. As a society, we seem to have equated narcissistic personality type behavior with people who are born leaders, meaning, you know, champions of industry, heads of banks, you know, even the people that we vote for. What, what's that all about? It, isn't it isn't it surprising that we have such access to information and yet yet we manage to put narcissistic sociopaths into positions of power almost every time one after another i mean i'm very disappointed in obama because you know i really believed all of that and read one of his books even before you know as he was on the campaign trail and he's so credible and then you watch War Machine and find out that Stanley McChrystal spent 70 days trying to get orders from the commander in chief in the surge in Afghanistan and failing. And then you see the report, which only came out last month, and find that Obama actually blocked the release of the Feinstein report, showing 
the systematic torture used by the CIA, and not a single member of the CIA was prosecuted or suspended. <laughs> there was QAnon nonsense about Trump cleaning out government. Well, he's left the CIA in place, you know. What should we be teaching not just children, but adults about how to spot these kinds of predators, how to protect ourselves from these kinds of behaviors, and how to keep narcissistic personality types or these types of bad people out of our lives? I think the first thing is to say, and at this point I always quote Shakespeare, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. And when we look at malignant narcissists and sociopaths, they certainly fit into all three of those categories. The criminal psychopath, as studied by Kent Keel using fMRIs on about 500 people, I think, thus far, who have committed awful crimes, he found that, that there is a physiological reason, which is an absence in the paralimbic system that connects the responsive, reactive part of the brain, the limbic system, the old brain, to the the um, prefrontal cortex, where supposedly we think, I'm, I'm not sure where we think personally, or, or if we think <laughs> often, but that, so there are some people who are born this way, there are some people who, because of the maltreatment they received as children, will develop this way, and there are some people who, because their girlfriends left them, never want to have their heart broken again, so decide they're going to become hard, and they achieve this. So that's the first thing, because the next part of that is the ones who are born that way are incurable. All you can do is restrain them, you know, by whatever means, but, but probably prison. They are estimated to make up about 3% of men and 1% of women. But that's an estimate. You know, that's, it's impossible to say out of 7.5 billion people in the world. And those estimates also come out of largely studies in America and Canada. We found that many of the psychological studies that have been done in America don't actually apply in China or in other places. There are very different numbers. So who knows what the numbers are? But I would tend to agree that a very large percentage of people do have a personality disorder. It's good to find out what those disorders are. The descriptions of them in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, it's available online. And you can look up narcissistic personality disorder, and the description is, is not in Latin. It's perfectly comprehensible. I mean, the first stage is obviously to go to my YouTube channel and, and see what I've said, rush out and buy my book, Opening Minds, which has a, a broader description. My job has been to refine and say, well, OK, what, what are the principal characteristics? And I think seeing those things should interest people in looking further. The, the first characteristic is that these people are mean. You know, I, I teach that we should forgive, but we should not forget that if somebody is mean to me once, then shame on them. But if they're mean to me twice, shame on me. So I think having a low tolerance for unpleasant behaviour and being willing to make an assertive statement about it is important. I think that a shift in our educational system, I'm a huge fan of Matthew Lippmann, and his notions, or um, Sir Ken Robinson, that they've put forward ideas about education that empower children uh, as part of a community of learning rather than making them you know, on the receiving end. I think that's very important. But part of that is to look at what are the motivations of such a person. When Eric Fromm, who first came up with the term malignant narcissist in, in around about 1961, when Fromm looked at these people, he said Freud and his friends are wrong. Because what they say is a narcissist is a person who only loves himself, him or herself, and loves no one else. And Fromm says, no, th this is a person who, who doesn't love anybody. So people who want to be adulated, and you know, there your friend would, would talk about the histrionic personality disorder, that there is at one end of the spectrum you have people who are exhibitionists. They, you know, they go up on stage and wear very high heels and you know, huge glasses and sparkly suits and play the piano, and they called Elton John. But that's at the end of, of people who are performers, who are exhibitionists, and that's absolutely fine. They can be bloody annoying in real life, you know, because they uh, look at me, look at me, look at you know, all the time, but that's all that's going on. Then you get the people who they have to have adulation or they collapse, the vulnerable narcissists, who are probably the larger 
population. I mean, and they will demand your praise. So, I mean, one of the ways of telling them is that they hate it when anybody else is praised. They'll be, well, what about me? You know, I mean, so, okay, he, he ran a mile in four minutes, but, but I, can, I can run a mile in six minutes. You know, they, they've, they have a skewed sense of, of their own worth and importance. And it's because there's something desperately wrong with them. The good thing about, you know, because many of these people do have it thrust upon them or achieve it, is that you can do something about it. And the wrong thing to do is what Donald Trump calls a witch hunt. That's labeling these people and then going after them. Well, the people doing, you know, in charge of going after them will be themselves narcissists and psychopaths. You know, that's what happens every time. We should. If they are this, in the small percentage of people who are psychopaths, we should lock them up and treat them with compassion and kindness and have regard to their human rights. It's a horror to me what happens in prisons because of this nasty presumption that if somebody's in prison, they deserve to be treated as if they were scum. We now know from enough studies that that will actually make them worse people. The Montaka study showed that by treating adolescents who have the pre-psychopathic conditions by treating them with compassion they could function as relatively um, social people james fallon who's a neuroscientist who, who runs two biotech companies discovered by accident that he in fact had the born paralimbic deficit of the psychopath and he realized that his behavior was sociopathic but he's what's called a pro-social sociopath. So even somebody who's born this way, there are ways of, of bringing them back. So hunting them down and trying to eradicate them from the population or, you know, is not the right way. But certainly understanding who they are and not giving into their behaviours. So creating pro-social behaviours and looking at, at what the antisocial behaviours are. This last couple of months I've been deeply immersed in in the history of Chinese brainwashing and, and reading Jung Tang's and John Holliday's amazing book, Mao of the, the Unknown Story. Uh, and it really was the unknown story before they got into it. It's astonishing that historians hadn't dug out of this material. And you find that this man who is the largest mass murderer in all history, 70 million people died because of Mao. He loved watching torture. And it's this, you know, the way that people will enable such a person that all the people around him complained about his behavior and nothing ever happened and he eventually was elevated to the head of state where he carried on murdering i mean the first year they killed a million people october 49 to october 1950 they killed a million people they just went out and killed people that this can happen in a society and it can happen quite quickly in a society the chinese having been relatively more civilized than most other people around them for centuries degenerated into this fury fairly rapidly and that by by saying no by by going i'm not going to participate i'm not going to do that we can gain back a little power but i keep saying it teaching how to recognize the predator and the techniques that are used in seduction and recruitment is fundamental teaching kids to be intelligently disobedient and to be assertive which is to say to be able to disagree agreeably is phenomenally important to the future of, of our species. We are not naturally saintly animals. You know, the, the his, history of humanity is a history of warfare and struggle, but that's not all it is. It's also a history of achievement and the making of beauty and the making of community. And there have been human communities that didn't have warfare at all, that don't seem, you know, like the Kogi and uh, Colombia seem to have been free of warfare. The San in the Kalahari, the Baaka Pygmy, there have been human societies that have survived without hurting one another, but not many of them. So, you know, I, I think it is a culture, uh, and that word has cult at the beginning of it. Philip Zimbardo says in The Lucifer Effect, which is a fascinating book, that he thinks he has proved that evil is largely something that's indoctrinated into people, that it's something that's taught, it's something that's learned. And he goes on to say that he thinks that good is the same, though he has no evidence for it. I think he's wrong. I think it's, 
you know, that you don't indoctrinate good into people. Goodness comes about when people make their own decisions. They don't follow a moral code that says, well, you won't go to heaven if you're not nice to people. They follow a moral code because they believe it to be right, just as Philip Zimbardo has done, in fact, because virtue is its own reward. And because as a grown up, you feel comfortable, not through seeking thrills for yourself, though we should all have some thrills now and then, but by looking to the happiness of other people, by looking to being pro-social, as Eric Fromm put it, life affirming, rather than life denying or antisocial. The craziness comes, it would say, with uh, Osahara, the Um Shinrikyo guru, who used an obscure Buddhist doctrine called power, which is that you accelerate people's karma. So you do horrible things to people. They wanted to murder everybody in Japan for their own good. And I think when anything is presented that is harmful to other human beings, that will hurt other human beings, then that's life denying. That's antisocial. And having a very simple moral set of values that says we should look after other people. We should do the best we can. If they're dangerous to others, then we should restrict their movement. But we should not become inhumane towards anybody. And you know, the terrible thing that the CIA did in torturing people, what they called waterboarding, which, by the way, was a technique first used by the Spanish Inquisition in the 16th century. But proper waterboarding, you put a, a wet towel over somebody's face. What they were doing was not waterboarding. They were pouring water through the towel into people's lungs. And it got them no results. It, it, it created a situation, if you looked at it, when... 9-11 happened, there were 479 people, all of whom are named and known, in the four groups that are lumped together as Al-Qaeda by the media. But there were, in fact, at least three quite separate groups there, 479 people. Because of the response to that, by 2003, there were 35,000 people in Al-Qaeda. Now we are talking of probably more than 100,000. And the right things have not been done most of these people are not psychopaths. Most of these people are genuinely affected by the abuses that were visited upon Muslims as a consequence of the response to 9-11 and throughout the 20th century by the British, the French and the Americans in the Middle East. And if we're going to solve that problem, we have to do truth and reconciliation. We have to say, we're very sorry for the horrible things we did. We have to admit it. You know, we're sorry that the Shah of Iran was put in by the British and the Americans in the overthrow of the democratic government in 1953. You know, we have to admit that. And we have to look at the positive elements of Islam, the translation movement of the ninth century, and how Western science has, you know, the Sorbonne, Oxford, Bologna, the first universities in Europe, were all founded to discuss the teachings of Ibn Sena, called Avicenna in the West. His commentaries upon Aristotle, all three of our oldest universities started to talk about teachings by a Muslim. And, you know, we have our quarantine, hospitals, medicines, surgery, all sorts of things that came in, even washing, which was something that uh, Christians didn't do very much in the 12th and 13th century. It came from Islam. Of course, there's a degeneration in Islam that the Ottomans were, by the end of their time, what they were doing was horrific, you know, I'm the oldest boy, I'm going to kill all 140 of my brothers to make sure none of them try and take the caliphate from me. But it's not really good practice. But realising that these divisions and this polarisation, which is very much an aspect of authoritarianism, that there's a spectrum. There are shades of grey, and more than 50 of them as well. And the same with disorders, that they, just like the autistic spectrum, which we now talk about, there's a spectrum for schizophrenia, there's a spectrum for paranoia. There's a spectrum for the borderline personality. And many of these things are actually curable. And, you know, the borderline personality and the narcissistic personality, we should be able to cure them. The problem is that until a person realizes they're suffering from it, it can't be cured. In your work with people who have left cults, what have you noticed that's different between people who were born into cults and people who voluntarily went into cults? If, like me, you know, I was 19, I came out of a, an Anglican Christian family, I'd you know, become an agnostic at the age of 13. But nonetheless, I had a, a very lovely home life, you know, I, I mean, I had three older brothers, my parents were nice people. And it meant that when I left Scientology, all I had to do was revert 
to you know what I believed before, which was you know, nice Christian ideas, Buddhist ideas, um, Lao Tzu, Jiang Tzu. If you grew up in it, you have nowhere to return to, and so you have to build a life. You have to build a way of, of looking at the world, which makes it you know that much more difficult. It's very important to recognize that authoritarianism is, it's just authoritarianism, whatever name we give to it. If you read about the way the Cultural Revolution happened in China, you know that a bunch of students decide that they don't like their professors. So they write to Mao, who is losing power by this time. And he says, oh yeah, um, that's great. The Red Guard, you, you, that's a great name, love it. Go and kill your teachers because um, you know, they're bad people. And you realize that a whole society can become a cult. And as you look back, you kind of go, well, actually, whole societies have been cults. You know, there was a, a wave of people that swept through Europe about 5,000 years ago, the Yamnaya. And genetic testing in recent years has shown they killed every male they found, just in the same way that chimpanzees will do if they take over another pack, they kill all the males. So there's a genetic bump that happens four or 5,000 years ago and the, as these people come through. So we're saying a whole society was psychopathic when the Golden Horde burst out of Mongolia, murdering hundreds of thousands of people. You know, a whole society can go this way. You see the Nazis, the Bolsheviks, some of the dodgy things that, that you know, the Americans have done over the years, uh, certainly the genocide of, of the Native Americans, the genocide of the Tasmanians and of um, many Aborigines by the British, or, or what they call Gistador. These awful things have been happening throughout history and we are escaping. History is a, a nightmare from which I am trying to escape, as a clever man once said. It's also a Mississippi of lies, as, as Voltaire once said. I'm tremendously optimistic, let me say that. And I, I haven't always been. You know, when Scientology steamrolled me, and uh, nobody came to help me, you know, apart from my own family. That was really shocking to me. I started thinking that maybe I should change my religion to misanthropy, that being nice to people was probably a bad mistake. But as the years have gone by, coming back from all of that, which was a long time ago, I am quite hopeful. I, I think that people like Greta Thunberg, bless her little soul, are hammering home a point that it's time to stop pretending it's time to stop you know rigging the statistics and listening to the spin doctors and actually each of us taking on responsibility and doing what we can to create community and to help one another my thing is that i i don't want to be a guru really unless you know, people send me enough money and i have a big enough harem obviously <laughs> that would change my mind but I don't know. I don't want to be a guru. And it's a position I have been in, you know, because I was the guru of ex Scientology for some time. And there'd be people walking up to me I'd never met being far too grateful. You know, not, not enough of them, but, you know, people would be coming up and there'd be that light sort of tinge of adulation. And the, the point is really to get other people to talk about it, to get other people to think about it, to get people to realize that we all have our own talent. We're all unique and exceptional. I've met Down syndrome kids who, you know, just really blew me away with their obvious perception of the world and how it works. You know, they could see something that I didn't see. So I think that everybody has something of value to contribute. It's just becoming life affirming, being life affirming. I don't believe in, you know, an afterlife of any kind. Uh, I don't believe in a non afterlife either. I take Jiang Su's position on this, which is I couldn't care less because this is it now. And I think that humanity has a phenomenal chance in the next few years of actually breaking free and, and becoming kinder, becoming better. But at the moment, when you look around the world at the people leading and in charge and the vast stupidity and selfishness, which is taught in our society, narcissism is taught as, you know, as I was taught at school, to be rich and powerful is the aim, just like Jesus was, you know, if you look to the Plains Indians, so-called Indians, the Cheyenne, the uh, Lakota, or Sioux, they considered somebody worthy who gave away the most. I mean, in the potlatch culture up, you know, with the Tlingit up in the Northwest, it, it maybe got a bit too excessive because they were giving everything away. But 
at the end of a buffalo hunt, the, whoever got the most buffalo had to give them all away. And it, it meant that when they were put on reservations, they gave all their stuff to the white guys that came around and who knew this. Um, but that, you know, you see that a culture can be generous in its basis. I mean, there are other things they did, you know, like if you watch the, the film A Man Called Horse, there are other things that they did about that, that aren't so nice and I, I'm not so supportive of. But that notion of generosity within that culture is missing in Western culture, that, that avarice and greed, you know, and the idea of building up a billion dollars. You know, when Bill Gates was asked why he didn't run for president, he basically said, hey, <laughs> I'm more powerful than the president, you know. And that's the truth. And it shouldn't be. There shouldn't be like a group of plutocrats who are determining the future of humanity. We should be aiming, I think, towards democracy. John Atak, thank you so much for being with me today to discuss this very important topic. If you want to know more about John's work, you can visit his YouTube page, which will be a link in the description. And you can buy a copy of any of John's books where most books are sold. Thank you for listening to On Belief, a podcast about cults. I'm Karen Geyer. You can follow me at at K-A-R-E-N-G-E-I-E-R or follow the podcast on Instagram or Twitter at OnBeliefPod. And you can contribute to the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Karen Geyer. You can also visit our website. It's just OnBelief.com. 